All right, if you have your Bibles, turn with me to the Gospel of Luke, chapter 12. And verse number 25. And we return to our study, part two, of Jesus' teaching in this passage on the subject of anxiety and worry, which are issues for all of us to one degree or another. As I said last time, the, the world has its way of dealing with stress and worry and anxiety, which is primarily medication. And we talked about that last time, so I won't go through all that again. But what we are interested in here is what does Jesus have to say about this? And just by way of quick review to get us back in the flow of this passage, we said, first of all, worry is a failure to fully understand, to fully grasp God's priority for us. So remember, look now back with me in verses 22 and 23. Jesus is speaking and he said to his disciples for this reason, I say to you, do not worry about your life as to what you will eat, nor for your body as to what you will put on. For life is more than food and the body is more than clothing. And the point is, God didn't create you just to survive. Man, look, as you know, I've worked in so many different kinds of settings in my day job. Some highfalutin, others not. And currently... As you know, I am daily in the very blue collar, lower end of the working class. And everywhere I go, on deliveries, places of industry, shipyards, sugarcane farms all over Acadiana, I frequent sea stores during the day to get payday or Gatorade or the horse stables that I regularly go to to deliver horse feed and chicken feed and all the rest. Everywhere I go, I see people grinding out the workday, living paycheck to paycheck, just trying to survive life in America. And it's really sad to think about Literally, if they are outside of Christ, that is what life is all about for them every single day. And then when they get too old to work anymore, so many of them barely get by on whatever social security dribbles out to them each month. And then they die. And if they are not in Christ, things then get infinitely worse for them at that point. But if you're a believer here today, things are very different for you. God didn't redeem you, Christian, just so you could have food and clothing and survive. Your life is far more than eating and clothes. As we said last time, you have to begin to grasp God's divine priority for your life. If you've come to Christ, 
on His terms of repentance and faith. If you sit here this morning and you are in His kingdom salvifically, I'm here to tell you that He has a very distinct plan and purpose for your life. That's the reason why you live. That's the reason you are sitting in here today right now breathing His air. And as long as God has a distinct plan and purpose for your life, He will see to it. Absolutely. No question about it. That you are fed and that you are clothed until His plan for you is complete. And you live your last day on this earth. So, what is there for us to worry about in the physical, material world. This, this world that we have to live in, this short time that we exist in until He brings us to glory is not what our focus is to be on. And that's what Jesus is saying here. Jesus is saying in this text that there is really no place at all in the life of a Christian for, for worry or for fear or for anxiety if you understand that the, the priority that God has for your life is far more than just surviving, getting by. God's purpose in giving you life and giving you a body to exist in during your short stay here is not material. It's not physical. It's not earthly. For you, Christian, it's spiritual. It's heavenly. We were made for His glory. We were redeemed. To serve His glory. To serve His purpose. To live lives that honor Him. One of my favorite things about preaching is that every Sunday I get to stand behind a pulpit and get you to focus on giving your attention to Him. Not to me. Bringing attention to God through His Word. Getting you to focus on Him. Now, all this doesn't mean that you don't work hard and save and make wise investments and be a good steward over what you have. But at the same time, you got to understand it's all His. Everything you have is His. You are just a steward of all that is His. He governs, He sustains, He oversees everything you have in the physical, material world. And yes, He uses your working, your saving, your wise decision making as a means to get it all done. But ultimately, you need to understand that God is the one who is sovereignly taking care of you every day. Because you, Christian, are here for a completely different reason than the rest of the world. A spiritual reason. Not a physical reason. Not an earthly reason. And you, as we learned last week, are not going to be here one day, one hour past when God determines that His purposes for you here on this earth are done. Not one second past that. And realizing all that should get you to be more concerned in your life, in your day to day, for laying up treasure then on, in heaven 
rather than laying up treasure here, which is all going to burn up one day. My new house is going to burn up one day. Before that, probably somebody else is going to be living in it that's in this room right now. And I'm going to be gone. And Christy's going to be gone. And life's going to go on until Jesus returns. Now, secondly, we learned last time that worry is a failure to fully grasp God's provision for us. And this connects to what I just said about God providing everything that we have. And the point is made there, look with me, in verse 24. Jesus says, Consider the ravens, for they neither sow nor reap. They have no storeroom nor barn, and yet God feeds them. How much more valuable you are than the birds. He feeds the birds who have no spiritual value in their life on this earth. I mean, they do give God glory with their existence, but they only do that in a very limited way. And yet God feeds them. They don't sow or reap for their food or store anything in a barn. They just pick up what God provides. We talked about that last time. And his point is this. Christian, you are so much more valuable to him than they are. And if God has made a priority for your life, then he'll make the provision to make sure that the priority in your life is met. He will sustain you to the point where you accomplish all of the purposes that he has for you in serving him. So, so worrying about life's necessities then is a failure for us to understand God's priority for us and God's provision to make sure that that priority is completed. That leads us to a third point, And I only introduced this last time. Worrying is a failure for us to fully, fully grasp God's privilege. What do I mean by that? Look in verse 25. And which of you, by worrying, can add a single hour to his lifespan? If you then cannot even do a little, very little thing, why do you worry about other matters? Now, what is this about? This is about the idea that somehow you think you can control the length of your life. You can't do that. You know you can't do that. And so if you can't even do that very little thing, Jesus is saying, by all your worrying and your anxiety, then, then what are you doing worrying and being anxious about all these other matters like your body and your clothing and your food? Like I said last time, people today are obsessed with their health. Obsessed with trying to extend the length of their life. It's a billion dollar industry each year of vitamins and supplements and exercise equipment and on and on it goes with people doing all that they possibly can to squeeze as many days out of this life as they can get on this earth. And look, I'm not saying, listen carefully, that a healthy lifestyle doesn't matter. Look, it's good to be disciplined in the way you eat. It's good to exercise. It's good not to, to be gluttonous. I mean, it's not good to eat McDonald's every day. I mean, if you do, you're going to be real sorry pretty quickly if you do that, right? You ever seen that show where that guy did that for how long was it? Like six months and he blew up like a toad and was about to die? But the point here is, God sovereignly determines exactly how many days we're going to live on this earth. And if you worry about how long you're going to live and you spend all your money trying to prolong your life, that's not a good stewardship of the life that God gave you, is it? Again, you've got to be reasonable. You need to be healthy. You need to have some self-discipline. But you're not going to do anything to add 
to the days of your life. In fact, if you sit here and you worry about that, you're going to contribute to your disability because worry and anxiety and fear affects the heart, affects the nervous system, and can cause all kinds of problems for you. We are not the determiners of the span of our lifetimes is what Jesus is saying. And that's what I mean when I say that that is God's divine privilege. In fact, it's his privilege to determine where we're born. Aren't you glad he had you to be born here and not in the Ukraine or Afghanistan, which he easily could have done because it's right to do so. His right to do whatever he wants, when he wants, how he wants to. He determines to whom you're born, when we're born, what time period we're born in. Aren't you glad you're now not in 1800, right? And he determines how long we're here. Completely determines. And if you're a believer, God has given you not only physical life, he's given you spiritual life as well. And he will sustain that life again until that service is done. And guess what? Worrying about that makes no contribution to that whatsoever. None. Now, number four. Worry is a failure to understand divine preference. Look with me, verses 27 and 28. Jesus goes on. Consider the lilies. How they grow. They neither toil nor spin, but I tell you, not even Solomon in all his glory clothed himself like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass and the field which is alive today and tomorrow is thrown into the furnace, how much more will he clothe you, you men of little faith? And here now Jesus turns from the issue of food to clothing. Again, in the physical world, those are the two things people are concerned about. Nourishing the body, protecting the body, clothing the body. And he makes a comparison here that reveals his preference for his people. Look what he says. Consider the lilies. Now, lilies, that word, is not to be thought of in a technical sense like you think of an Easter lily, because if you look there in verse 28, right behind it and connected to it, he said, God so clothes the grass. Well, what he's referring to here in general is the wild grasses that grew all throughout the land of Israel that flowered out in all kind of ways. I saw them coming up Poor Road this morning in the springtime. You see that. They were all over Israel. So, so this is Jesus, just like last week when he, he would have looked and pointed to the birds that were all around him. He's saying to this crowd, this original crowd, look at all these flowers growing all over the place. And they're all at the end of these endless stems of grass on these hillsides that we're looking at here. Look at how they're growing. They're not toiling to grow. They're not working. They're not laboring. They're not spinning. They don't labor over their clothes. They don't labor over their beauty. And yet, if you will take, you could do it today, take a petal off of a flower, even a wildflower. You get a hold of a microscope and look at that flower under a microscope. The intricate, amazing, texture and color and design of even the simplest flower under a microscope is absolutely mind-blowing. I can tell you, you can take the most expensive, beautifully manufactured Parisian garment out of wool or cotton or some kind of synthetic, and you can look at that under a microscope and it looks rough. Put them side by side. There's no comparison. I'm sure you can go on the internet and see a comparison of, of a garment and a flower. There's no comparison. There is an unmistakable refinement and symmetry and beauty in the close-up look at a, at a flower petal that cannot be produced by man. That can only be produced by God. And so what Jesus is saying is, look. Look at these flowers. They don't work to get that clothing that they have. 
But I tell you, not even Solomon in all his glory could have clothed himself like one of these. Now the best dressed man in the history of Israel was Solomon. You can read all about his lavish life and his attire in 1 Kings and 2 Chronicles. Solomon had the finest robes and clothes of his day. But Jesus says even Solomon in all his glory never wore things like the petal of a flower that God makes. Flowers, they're not here long, are they? They live and they die. And they just give a brief little testimony to the amazing beauty of this God of order that we serve. This God of amazing design. This God of infinite variety. Can you think about all the different types of amazing flowers that are in the world? You just ride down this road and look at an amazing variety of flowers, beauty and color. But the point is this, verse 28. But if God so clothes the grass in the field, which is alive today and tomorrow is thrown into the furnace, how much more will he clothe you, you men of little faith? Now you see what I mean by God's preference for us, his children. Now the deal, what's that with about the grass being thrown into the furnace? Well, let me tell you about that. First, in that day, they cooked their meals in clay ovens. And the way that they regulated the temperature in that oven is the dry grass. And the, more, the hotter you wanted to get the oven, the more dry grass that you put into it. Kind of like us doing the dial to 350. And they had it down to an art. And so Jesus is saying this, this grass with these wildflowers, it has such a short life. We just take it and throw it in the furnace and burn it up to cook our meals. But look how God clothes it. Look how concerned he is to bring glory to himself with those flowers that are just going to burn up in our ovens. So how much more will he clothe you, his family members, adopted by grace into his kingdom? And if knowing that, you still live your life with fear and worry and anxiety. Well, what category does that put you in, believer? Well, look at the end of verse 28. You men of little faith. That's the issue, right? Where's your faith in your Redeemer? Where's your trust to get you through retirement? Is it in yourself? Or is it in the Lord? Jesus hit the disciples with this subject many times in the gospel. And basically he was saying to them, what is it about me that you don't trust? Notice he didn't say here, these folks didn't have any faith. He called them what? Men of what? Little faith. What about you? What about your life? Has he not proven to you yet that you can trust him? Has he not proven over and over to you that you can trust him? So next in verse 29. He says, and do not seek what you will eat and what you will drink. Don't make that the pursuit of your life. And what does he say next? Do not keep worrying. Because he knows that's what we do. Again, he's not saying don't work to, to earn your living. Just sit and wait to be provided for. Don't prepare your meal. What he is saying is don't make that be what you live for. That's what he's getting at. Don't live for the American dream of the big house and the cars and the boat and all the, the stuff. All things earthly. That's what people outside of Christ do. We live to bring God glory. That's number one for us. That's the overarching purpose for why we exist as Christian people. To bring God glory with how we live. And so he says, don't keep worrying about earthly things. 
So what you got to do, church, is grab hold of what we talked about so far from last week to right now. God's priority, God's provision, God's privilege to determine the end of your life, and God's amazing personal preference for you, the one for whom Jesus bled and died. The one for whom the Son paid the infinite cost by bearing all of the wrath due to you upon himself. He has preference for you over everything else that he has created. Now, there's a fifth principle, God's fatherhood. Listen, you have to understand as a Christian that God is your father. Look at verse 30. For all these things the nations of the world eagerly seek... But your father knows that you need these things, verse 31. But seek his kingdom and these things will be added to you. God prefers us, church, because he is our father. Here for the first time in the text, Jesus speaks of God as father. Your father. He's talking to all believers that were sitting there that day all the way down through church history, all the way to us here today. And he makes a contrast, notice, to all these things being eagerly sought by the nations of the world. And here's the reality. And this makes the lost man wince when he hears this. If you don't have God as your father, who's your father? Well, Jesus made that clear in John chapter 8, right? Verse 44, when he told the lost Pharisees, you are of your father, the devil. Wow, boy, that sounds crazy, doesn't it? <laughs> but it's true. And either you believe Jesus about that when he said that, or you don't. There's no middle ground. I don't care how crazy that sounds to somebody that doesn't know Christ. That's what he said. And if the devil's your father, he makes no promises to you. He provides no benefits to you whatsoever. He's definitely not about doing your good in your life. So you're really on your own outside of the family of God. The only good that does come into your life is God's common grace. Remember, God's common grace is that grace that goes out to all people where he lets the rain fall on the just and the unjust. But let me tell you something about common grace. Very different from saving grace. It's very temporary. And you can pray to God all you want. But if you have not bowed your knee in saving faith to the Lord Jesus Christ on His terms of repentance and faith, those prayers that you make to God never get past the ceiling of your house. The unbelieving world has no promises from God, no commitments from God, no guarantees from God about anything because they daily live in constant rebellion to Him. They reject his son. They reject his word. Just like I did for 28 years. So according to verse 30, eating, drinking, clothing, that's all these things. The nations of the world look there, eagerly seek. That phrase is strong in the, in the Greek. Eagerly seek, to strive after. I mean, that is life for the unregenerate. It's the battle for survival. It's the dog-eat-dog -dog world, especially here in America where life is all about acquiring things and stuff. But when you are going through life, literally, spiritually dead, all that you have is this physical world. That's all you have. And you are left to yourself to reap whatever you can from the common grace of God. And in His common grace, He gives a lot to some that are not His and some very little and all points in between. Now, those folks may create an idea of God in their minds. That's the most popular God in America. They may follow the gods of false religion, but any good 
that comes to them is really just the common grace of the true God. And he's ordained that to be a part of his plan for mankind. But they're totally on their own. And they are stuck. Just trying to survive and live out their lives really in a totally physical and materialistic way. And if they're religious at all in any way, they are deceived because behind all false religions is the father of lies. He lies through every one of them. But next, notice in verse 30, in contrast to this, Jesus says, but your Father knows. You need these things, these earthly things, these temporal things. Now listen, church, you know He has the power to give you whatever He wants to give you. You know He has the resources. If you're a Christian here today, you know He has love for you and grace for you. Thank God, mercy for you and, and compassion for all believers. And that is all Absolutely fantastic. But think about this. To understand that He knows that we need these things while we're here. That He knows that. That's a big deal. That's a big deal for Him to know that. That should bring you a lot of comfort. One way he knows that is because he came here and he lived here as a man. Your father, Jesus says, in contrast to all the lifeless little G gods of the pagans, is your father. And he acts like a father acts. And a father is a provider and a protector. And your father, Christian, knows every minute of every day exactly what you need. So what are you worried about? What are you anxious about? What are you anxious about in this, the rest of the very short life that you are living here on his earth? What are you, what are you, what are you worried about? Now, how do we tap into this? To not be worried, to not be anxious, to not be fearful that Jesus is telling us how do we connect with what the Father has for us? Well, look in verse 31, and he's going to tell you. But seek his kingdom, and these things will be added to you. Pretty simple. That's the key. Food, drink, clothing, living a life free from worry, free from fear, free from anxiety. You need those things. He knows you need those things. And he's saying to you, so don't focus on those things. Don't make that be the warp and woof of your life, the physical things, food, drink, clothing, health. Focus on this, Jesus is saying, the kingdom of God. Let that be first. Let that be the priority. Let that be your focus. Seek the kingdom of God and all these things that you need and that the Father knows that you need will be added to you. Jesus put it this way in Matthew 6, 33. Same sermon. But seek first His kingdom and His righteousness and all these things will be added to you. Oh, this is so simple, but yet so critical for us to understand. Instead of worrying about all things physical, your bank account, your retirement, the length of your life, food, clothes, your stuff, instead of focusing on that as the rest of the world continually does, let the dominant enterprise of your life, unlike the world, be about pursuing the kingdom of God. That is what Jesus is saying. Spiritual growth. Growing more and more towards spiritual maturity in your life. Being conformed to the image of Christ in your life. All the world has is their stuff. That's all they have. The stuff of the world. The focus of our life is to worship God. 
To worship Him corporately like we're doing here today. To worship Him individually. To serve Him. To proclaim Christ. To proclaim His gospel. To strive every day to live in obedience to His Word. Listen to Colossians. Colossians chapter 3 and verse number 1. Look at it. Therefore, if you have been raised up with Christ, keep seeking the things above. Stop seeking after the things here. Live your life for the kingdom. And everything that you need in the physical will be added unto you. It'll be taken care of. Now, God may add a lot more than you need. I mean, He certainly has in most of our lives, right? He's added way more than what we need. Paul says there in Colossians 3.1, keep seeking the things above. Look next. Where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God, Seek Christ's glory. Seek Christ's honor with your life. Seek to proclaim Christ as Savior and substitute and King to people in your spheres of influence. Submit to His will for your life. Submit to His authority in your life. Submit to His word in your life. Paul says next there in verse 2, Set your minds on things above, not on things that are on the earth. For you have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. You are different. You are different from everybody else. Folks, what I'm saying and what Jesus is saying here is that this is all about living your life for the glory of God above everything else that you do and not for the things of the world. And when you do, your Father promises to take care of all the things that you need until your very last day. So seek to live to store up treasure in heaven rather than on the earth. I'm here to tell you that life is so much better when you live this way. There's one more point, closing with this. Worry is a failure to understand divine pleasure. Go back to Luke 12, verse 32. Jesus says, do not be afraid, little flock. For your Father has chosen, and look at this next amazing word, has chosen gladly to give you the kingdom. That is beyond my mind's capability to comprehend. It's God's delight. What what delights God? Well, it's the same thing that delights an earthly father to provide for his children that he loves. If you are his in saving faith in Christ alone, think of this. He has chosen gladly, gladly. It's his delight to give you the kingdom. That means all that he has is yours. So what is there to worry about? Nothing. Let's pray. Father, how we thank you for this amazing teaching from the Lord Jesus himself. There's no better teaching in this book than the words of Christ. Truly God, truly man, the God man who came to this earth to be a substitute for sinners like us. And when we come to him in saving faith, every single bit of everything I have said here today applies to us. Wow. So there's no need to worry. There's no need to be anxious. Even though for your purposes, you may put us through some very hard things for our sanctification, which we need because we're being conformed to the image of Christ and that chisel and that hammer has to go to work on sinners like us. At the end of the day, as David said, we'll never be begging bread because you will see to it to take care of us all the way to the end. How good you are to us. And we praise you on your day. In Jesus' name.
we pray today. Amen.